I thank y'all for having me here today. I love coming and speaking at Breath Matters. Um, some of you have been patients of mine in the past where I worked at pulmonary rehab for the last 10 years um, at Chippenham. Um, and so I was around when Russell started the group and very excited for him when I met him on my first day of work there. Um, and so this group has always kind of been near and dear to my heart because, well, many of my patients are members and, um, and because now I serve on your board as well. <laughs> so I'm getting more involved. Um, and so I'm glad y'all could have me today. Um, and kind of the chat lately um, in our board meetings was kind of topics that you guys um, could benefit from specifically during COVID pandemic, uh, after COVID, we, we, we call it after COVID and before COVID BC. Um, and so um, exercise has kind of been a hot topic because it's not as friendly to go and exercise in public gyms. People just don't feel comfortable doing that, that yet because, you know, the, the way that they're um, screening people maybe isn't very, um, I don't know, thorough. Um, and so, you know, a lot of folks aren't comfortable going back there. Gyms aren't really open um, on as far as full scale. Um, I know my sister has to make appointments to go to attend classes at her gym and only like 10 people can be in the room, or maybe even less than that. So exercise um, for the lung patient has been li limited, um, especially during COVID. So this is a hot topic. Um, and so I'm hoping that today after my chat with you guys that um, that you will leave with maybe some new ideas to incorporate into your exercise routine. routine. If you haven't been exercising at all, uh, maybe some nude, renewed motivation um, or a place to start. Um, and so feel free um, and I'll try to stop periodically at, so that you guys can kind of ask me questions um, and maybe get a little bit more background. So <clears throat> again, my name is Christina Hunt. Um, I am a respiratory therapist. And then Breathe Live Fit is a blog that I started in 2018, specifically for lung patients. Um, I just really identified through working in rehab that um, lung patients needed more education and, and whether it be daily, doing daily things, whether it be exercise, whether it be breathing techniques, it, I found that it didn't matter if you were late in the diagnosis or very early on, that the ongoing education was important. And so Breathe Live Fit is a blog that I started and um, up until January, I had been very good about posting routinely, and I'll get into more later why that has changed. Um, so we're going to move on with my presentation, which is going to be developing a home exercise program. And if I can get my slide to move, come on, Christina. There we go. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can move. I've got my little windows. I might have to move them every now and again because they're on the right side of my screen and my text is on the right side of the screen. So who am I? Well, I've been a respiratory therapist for 20 years. Um, I live here in the Richmond area, but I'm in northwest of Richmond I'm in Montpelier. Um, and so I'm, oh, and I said I'm a little bit of a, a hike from Cynthia to get that mug. <laughs> I mean, about an hour hike from Cynthia to get the mug. So um, anyway, so I'm out here in Montpelier and I've been here um, since, well, when we had kids in 2009, um, but I've always lived in the Richmond area, grew up in Mechanicsville, went to Lee Davis High School, then went to um, Virginia Tech, came back to Richmond, got my respiratory therapy degree, um, and I've been here ever since. Um, so early on in my career, I worked in adult pediatric and neonatal intensive care. Um, I did, I was over at St. Mary's doing most of that work. Um, before that I was at VCU health system. Um, but like I said, the last 10 years have been in pulmonary rehab and that is really where I, um, 
found my passion and my career was working in rehab. Um, there's just so much more fulfilling. Um, I got to know the patients much better than bouncing around from bedside to bedside. Um, I'm not, I don't consider myself a real adrenaline drunk. Why can't I speak? I hope I can speak today. Adrenaline junkie. <laughs> um, and so critical care was fun and it was uh, challenging, but I really wanted more of a holistic approach to my care. And I felt like I got that from our pulmonary rehab at Chippenham. I had an excellent mentor. If uh, any of you have gotten to know Chris Bashada, um, she was my mentor in pulmonary rehab. Um, and so I learned everything I know about pulmonary rehab from her. And, um, and she has a love for what she does as well, which I think helped grow my love for pulmonary rehab too. So um, that's really where this passion developed. Um, I mentioned the blog, but now as in starting um, January 4th of this year, um, I'm only as needed in pulmonary rehab, but I just took a new position of director of research, um, education and research uh, for bronchiectasis and NTM at the COPD Foundation. Um, that was kind of a dream come true in the sense that COVID had changed pulmonary rehab where we used to have 12, patients in there at any given time. Now they can only have five people total, six people total. And so I, I was really only working part-time when COVID began. Um, and so I really needed something to do other than, you know, fill in for Chris when she's absent. So um, this position came up, um, applied for it and got it. And it's been great. So um, if you have bronchiectasis and or MTM or MAC, um, I am actually writing content for their webpage. Um, and so you will get um, a lot of good information as we create it um, through their NTM and Bronc initiative, and it should be awesome. So um, right now it's very limited information on the COPD Foundation about Bronc and NTM, um, but hopefully we grow that in the next year. So I'm super excited about that because I can see like tangible things being done from my angle. On a personal level, I am a wife to Dan, a mom to Foster, Asher, and Caroline. Uh, my whole family, uh, for the most part, is in the uh, Richmond, Virginia area, with the exceptor, exception of my sister in Hilton Head. Um, and I have lots of friends in the area, including some of you in this meeting. <laughs> so um, very, very lucky gal, surrounded by good people in this area. Okay. So I'm going to move my little window over here. Okay. So we're going to give you some ideas um, for some home exercises. Um, and hopefully this will inspire you to move forward with, with your own routine or change things up. We'll just kind of see how you feel at the end of the program. So when it comes to a workout, what should it include? Um, the first thing is hydration, um, making sure that you're getting plenty of water. Um, I always tell uh, people to have water with them. Um, I, I'm one of those people that really has to be reminded to drink more water. Um, I just don't innately feel thirsty and I know that I dehydrated a lot of the time. And so, you know, the doctors recommend um, eight, eight ounce glasses a day. I personally think if I did that right now, I'd feel waterboarded. Um, so I, I always encourage patients if water, not drinking enough water is your thing, not, you know, it's kind of like your, your habit, like mine, um, to just try to increase your water intake by one glass a day over the period of the day. Um, and it should be a little bit easier to do so than just saying, okay, today I'm going to drink eight <laughs> glasses of water, um, which, you know, I know for many would not go well. Um, you'd spend more time running back and forth to the bathroom than you would exercising. So um, we're just going to try to hydrate well, have water with you so that you can take some sips. 
if you don't like the taste of water, there are some that just don't like the taste of water, um, then re I recommend squeezing some fruit into it. Or, you know, they've got those, I don't know what the makeup of those things are, but they have water flavor things like Mio's and um, little packets to shake into your water. Um, a little bit goes a long way. I don't think you ever have to use the whole packet or a lot of, I've, I saw my sister squirting her Mio into her water the other day. It was like, squirt. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> I think a few drops go a long way to kind of add to the taste, but, um, you know, so you can do things to kind of, uh, to change the taste of your water and still make it effective um, for hydrating you. The other thing to remember is to warm up. And I think we're all guilty of, okay, I have just this amount of time to get my, wor my workout done. Um, and so I'm going to rush through this warm up process. But, you know, warm up doesn't really have to take a long time. It really is just a great way, you know, four or five minutes just to get the joints moving, the heart rate up a little bit, um, whatever it is, whether, you know, you're moving your, your shoulders up around or you're stretching a little bit. Anything that you can do pre workout um, for a warm up. Uh, will, you know, will help to reduce the likelihood of injury one, um, and it will make, help make you less sore if you, you know, after your extra exercise as well. Um, and it is just overall better for you. Um, and so you should warm up, stretch, move around a little bit just to kind of get your body used to moving, especially if you've been fairly sedentary um, most of the day prior to the exercise. Um, and so the other things we have to think about when it comes to um, at a work, what a workout should include is some aerobic exercising to increase our endurance, um, some strength training to build muscle, and some stretching to decrease muscle soreness and increase flexibility. And when I talk about aerobic exercise to increase endurance, we're basically you're improving your endurance so that you can go and do the things that you enjoy um, with less breathlessness. Um, so I tell my patients, it's not how fast we're getting through the exercise. It's not how fast you're going on that treadmill. It's focusing the length of time you spend doing that aerobic exercise because ultimately that translates to better quality of life outside the workout outside the rehab, outside the gym, is that if the longer you can go and do, the longer you can enjoy those extra, the, enjoy being and doing um, while you're out, outside, out and about and with family and, and whatever you enjoy doing. Um, strength training will just assist your muscle groups and doing everyday tasks with a little more ease and less breathlessness. So we do strength training to get up and out of the car without feeling breathless. We do strength training to be able to carry some groceries in without being completely wiped out. Um, we do strength training to carry the laundry from one room to the, another. Um, we're not trying to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're not trying to be like big bodybuilders, um, but we wanna build those that muscle strength because overall you're using them every day to do everyday tasks. So, um, you know, as much as we'd love to see an athlete uh, with chronic lung conditions, mo most often, 99% of the time, we're building people who um, just want to live their daily life happier, healthier, stronger, and enjoy the things that they want, they like to do. So that's why we're doing the exercises so that we can enjoy. Um, so some words of advice, <clears throat> always, always, always. <laughs> if I could say always one more time, I would, I should, um, always check with your doctor before starting a new exercise. If you haven't been exercising, some things to ask them are, what are some exercises do they think would be beneficial for you? Um, what things should you look for when you're exercising? What activities should you avoid um, with, you know, by exercising? And they might have some good insight 
for you before you begin. And I and, and it's important just to communicate that with them that this is you're gonna be your focus exercising what insight do they have for you it's always worth a you know a, a quick call or, or an email um, just to find out if they have any input in what you're going to do <clears throat> if you have been ordered oxygen continuously or with exertion be sure to use it while exercising um, I wouldn't try to do the activity without it and just see what happens um, I would most definitely um, wear the oxygen as ordered, continuously or with exertion, put it on. And the reason for that is, you know, our muscles use that oxygen in order to do work. And if, you know, you're not giving them what they need, you're not going to get the full benefit of the exercise. Um, so make sure that you're, you're wearing the oxygen. Very, very important. Um, also, you should monitor your oxygen um, and heart rate while you're exercising. Um, and by using a pulse oximeter, I really think any home exercise program should include using a pulse ox. Um, you know, even if you say, oh, my oxygen's never an issue. Um, I, I think it's a good idea to monitor it and just give yourself a little, a check every now and again. Do I want you wearing it like jewelry? No. But it's a good way to kind of quickly check the heart rate, quickly check the oxygen, and just make sure that everything looks good. Um, and if you start seeing numbers that don't look so good, um, those are red flags that you need to have those conversations with your doctor saying, you know, I'm seeing dips in my oxygen, or I'm seeing these excessively high heart rates when I'm exercising. What should we do now? Um, and so some of that can be, um, using that pulse ox could be a good way to kind of show you a flat red flag before you even really feel it um, or symptomatic of it. So I, I always think it's a good idea if you're doing this on your own to have a way to monitor yourself. Um, one of the things I preach is if it hurts, don't do it. <laughs> um, so our focus is not no pain, no gain. Um, I always told my patients, if it were, you guys would never want to come back and see us again. Um, but we want you to exercise to the point of stretch, um, to where it just starts getting hard. And then we kind of back off. Either we have to either stop and rest or we slow up, um, but we don't push it to the point where it's painful. Uh, we don't we don't push our workouts to the point where the next day we're waddling around and our muscles hurt so bad. Um, or, you know, after the exercise, you're just plumb worn out and can't do anything else around the house. If you're doing that to yourself during your exercise, you have to ask yourself, is this exercise doing increasing my quality of life? Is it doing the things that I need it to do? Um, so make sure that you're not pushing yourself too hard. You're just stretching to where it just starts to feel uncomfortable for you. And then you're kind of pulling back a little bit. Um, and you can do that multiple times during your exercise. You can stretch it like, let's say you're walking on a treadmill and you're getting to the point where like, oh, this is starting to get hard. I'm gonna slow it up. I'm gonna catch my breath. And then I'm going to maybe push it a little bit again, um, or it may mean you just stop altogether. So um, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> if you feel any pain with any of the exercises you are doing, stop and try something different. Um, you should not feel to, so uncomfortable. And I know some of my patients struggled with chronic pain. Um, and so, you know, I think they, when If you struggle with chronic pain, you have to kind of figure out what your threshold is essentially. Um, but if you don't have, if you start doing a workout, let's say you're doing an overhead shoulder press and you're doing it and all of a sudden it hurts to lift your arm over your, your head, then you need to stop that exercise because something could be going on with the joint. Um, and so you should not be feeling pain. <laughs> It <laughs> should not hurt to do the exercises that you're doing. Um, great way 
um, to practice your breathing techniques is while you're exercising. Use per slip breathing or use your diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so per slips, just as a quick review, as I know many of you know what that is, um, is uh, breathing in through your nose and blowing out through per slips. And then the diaphragmatic breathing is when you breathe in, your belly goes out. And when you breathe out, the belly pulls in, helping your diaphragm move the air out of your lungs. <laughs> Losing words. Um, consider using your rescue inhaler before you get started. Um, Using that albuterol or whatever rescue inhaler that you use um, before exercise will help to open up the lung, the airways, um, help you to take deeper breaths in. Um, and so it kind of came as a recommendation for most people, especially if you respond to inhalers. I know my pulmonary fibrosis patients don't use inhalers and that's fine. But if you have an obstructive lung condition and you respond to your albuterol inhaler, I would recommend using it ahead of time. Um, get yourself breathing the best you can prior to the workout. Um, and that way you can go from there um, knowing that you're starting the exercise breathing your, your best. Uh, monitor your oxygen saturations. We mentioned the pulse oximeter. Um, start slow and then also keep a log of your exercise, not only because progress may be slow, but it's kind of, and that you can like check what your progress is over time, but it's kind of like your little brag book, so to speak. When you have a doctor's appointment, you can bring your little notebook of all the exercise you've been doing. It's, and it, it may say, I don't know, your oxygen saturations and heart rate that day, what you did for aerobic activity, um, what you, where you started when you strength trained and where you are at now. It's really a great kind of show and tell at the physician's office for what you've been up to as far as activity. Um, sometimes I tell patients, you kind of have to create the conversation with your physician. What they don't see in the snapshot that you give them in the office is a lot, <laughs> you know? So when you come to the doctor's office, the exercise log that you've been doing or keeping um, is a really great conversation starter um, to help collaborate with your physician on further exercises that you can do um, or maybe give him some insight into what you're seeing um, with the exertion because when he sees you in the office you're sitting down and typically have waited quite a while for him to come in so um, so you're completely at rest so this gives them an idea of what you look like and what those numbers look like when you're exercising so keep that brag book that log book um, of your exercise and you know be proud of the work that you're doing and be proud to show them um, what you've been up to okay so moving on for ideas for cardio um, and so this is where I think people struggle during COVID um, because if they didn't have anything in the home, um, they didn't know where to begin. Um, so my first bullet point was to dust off the, any old equipment that you have. Um, so if you were a fortunate person to have exercise equipment in your home, you definitely, and you haven't been using it, um, take the laundry off of it, um, inspect the cords, clean it off. Um, if it needs some maintenance, like some of the treadmills and stuff need some sort of like lubrication or oil on the little rollers, um, kind of get it all cleaned off before um, you start using it. Make sure it's running right. And you can turn those things on without you being on it. So you can stand to the side and turn it on, make sure it's functioning right. Um, so just get it um, ready for you to use, so to speak. Um, so hopefully if you have that kind of equipment in your house and here's the other thing, it may be in the garage and this might be a good time to get somebody to come on over and help you out to move it into a place that is conditioned that you can use it year round. Um, and so that may be, you need to make room for it in your house again. 
Um, and so it just takes a little pre-planning, but once you put a plan in, in place, you're going to feel better about um, starting the exercise. Then here's another idea. You can simply walk in place. I know it sounds too simple to even mention, but people don't think about just walking in place. Put on your favorite tunes, the latest show you're binge watching, okay? Um, I'm watching Good Girls on Netflix right now. I'm loving that. Um, and you can literally walk in place. Remember to tighten your core, like your abs, um, while you're walking a little bit to kind of, you know, at, increase your core strength. You can add more difficulty by doing some high knees, bringing those legs up even higher as you walk in place. Um, you can add ankle weights. You can order those from Amazon to increase difficulty. Um, you can use a timer on your watch, on your phone, on the microwave, wherever it is to time how long you've been walking and record those intervals, remembering your breathing techniques. I'm telling you, I wish I would think about walking in place as much TV as I've been binge watching over COVID pandemic, because I know I would have gotten tons of steps in. <laughs> so it's a relatively simple technique, but it can be done with absolute no extra finances put into it. The other thing you can do just to kind of mix it up is just a lateral shuffle, which means um, you can basically move back and forth from one side of your workout space to another by walking side to side. Why do we do that? Well, because it improves your lateral movement. It works other, it, it works similar muscle groups as walking, but actually incorporates other leg muscles into it because you're lifting the leg out to the side um, and stepping. Um, Again, you can put on music, you can binge watch shows while doing this. It's so simple, um, but, and we just don't think to do it. So again, time yourself while you're doing it. Use it in combination with walking in, in place. Um, and you'll be surprised, one, how long you're able to do it or, or how long you can, in, basically how fast you can increase the intervals in which you can do it. Um, if one little safety feature, if you're somebody who's just not steady on your feet, walking in place, you can just kind of put your hands on the back of a chair and, and walk in place, uh, making sure you don't pull the chair back on you, um, but hold, you can hold on to a back of a chair as you're walking. You can put that chair in front of the couch so that if you feel balance issues, you've got the, the couch behind you. So any other safety ideas you want to incorporate, it's perfectly fine. Um, you can walk in place at your kitchen counter um, if you like the idea of holding on to the countertop. Um, but yes, you can do it anywhere. Um, this other idea is a pedal exerciser. These little pedal exercisers are relatively cheap. Um, I would say, now they can the fancier ones could get up to like $60, $70, but the ones like in this picture are like 30 bucks. Um, and so they don't break the bank. Uh, now I know $30 is not the same to everybody, but in, in uh, comparison to something like a treadmill or like an exercise bike, um, a standard exercise bike, these are definitely cheap in, in regards to that, but they're very effective. Um, you'll see in the top picture, they've got, it's got a little knob on top and that's where you kind of adjust the resistance. Some of them have like a digital screen on them. Um, what I like about them is that they're lightweight. You can shove them in the, um, the front closet or your closet to kind of get them out of the way. Um, you can work out your legs by putting it in front of a chair on the floor, or you can put it on a tabletop and work your arms. Um, and then you just kind of time um, your sessions with the pedal exerciser as you go. I think it's a brilliant piece of equipment. They use it in our cardiac rehab um, at Chippenham. Um, they typically use it on top of a tabletop, um, but, they, but um, it can be used on the floor as well. 
And I think a lot of patients really like the idea of being able to use it in their home um, for relatively inexpensive cost. So pedal exercise are awesome. Some other ideas, dance party, you know, I, there, if you're a dancer or you just like to dance, you may not even be great at dancing, um, but you can do a dance party in your house, put on your favorite tunes, just have a great time and just move about the room, essentially adding that movement. Every song is typically, what, three to four minutes long. Um, so you dance, you sit down and break. Um, I know my kids love to have dance parties around here. We put on a little kids bop and all of a sudden I've got kids dancing in the family room and it's just so much fun. So just a good way to not only exercise in your house, um, but it also to lift your spirits as well. So um, I love a good dance party when it comes to get a workout. Um, spring is just around the corner. And if you're confident and comfortable um, walking outside. Um, I encourage you to do that on days that are mild. Um, keep in mind that, you know, when you're walking outside, obviously the terrain is not completely level. Um, there will be hills, there will be, um, you know, you can go uphill or downhill and it may feel more challenging. I, I typically get that question um, in rehab, why is walking outside so much more difficult than walking on this treadmill? I can walk so much faster on the treadmill. And it's because the treadmill is completely, completely level and we're in an air conditioned space. So, you know, you're affected a little bit more about uh, with the environment when you're walking outside, but spring is just such a beautiful time. If you're comfortable uh, walking outside, um, just, you know, soaking up that sunshine, you know, the environment, the blooms, whatever, um, by walking. Um, don't be shy about using assistive device. I never say, you know, you don't look sick, you don't look old by using a rollator, you look smart. Um, the, those that try to go without it and, you know, are at risk falling, um, it's just not, it's not smart if you, if you're on, you know, unstable on your feet. So when you use a rollator or any type of assistive walking device, it, you look smart using it. Um, and that comes from, you know, a healthcare person. Yes. Um, but I, when I presented that, uh, that idea that it doesn't make you look old or sick and makes you look smart. A lot of people are like, you know what? It is smart. And <laughs> Um, take a pulse ox with you. Um, I also encourage anybody who leaves their house or the, uh, to bring their cell phone with them. I, it's just another safety measure. Um, I, I recommend to my patients, even if they're going to walk around the, their, the perimeter of their yard um, to bring their cell phone, just, just for safety purposes, if you should need somebody emergently, not saying you will, but I'm a safety girl and I also try to always be prepared as a mom. So I try to have everything I need with me. Bringing a cell phone is not a bad idea when you're going for a walk. Um, last idea for um, ideas for cardio um, is what I call bottom step up, step downs. Um, essentially, if you have a set of steps in your house, um, you wanna practice just using the bottom steps of your staircase, um, essentially just the bottom step. I'm not saying go all the way up and go all the way down. I'm literally saying step up with your right foot, step down with your right foot, then step up with your left foot, step down with your left foot. Have a chair close by if your legs start to get tired, use your breathing techniques, breathe in, then blow out as you step up, breathe in and blow out as you step down, um, typically steps is one of the hardest things my patients tell me that they do on a daily basis. They'll say any amount of steps, doesn't matter how many steps. Um, so practicing your steps with your workout is a great way to build leg strength. It's a, if you can do it over a period of time, let's say you can do that bottom, um, step up, step down, um, you know, for two minutes or three minutes and you build your time. That's awesome monitor the oxygen and also monitor your heart rates because you may find that this is fairly difficult but it will build your less leg strength quickly um don't be tempted to go all the way up the stairs 
And I do I don't want to hear later that somebody said, well, it was feeling good. And so I went all the way up and then uh, couldn't go all the way down because I was exhausted. So um, take your time, just do the bottom step. It will be just as effective as if you climbed all the way up to the top um, as if you just stayed on the bottom. All right, let's see here. What is my screen doing? Hold on. Share. Okay. All right, hold on. Let me get rid of that. Okay, there we go. Does anybody have any questions about um, cardio exercises before I go on to some strength training exercises? Anybody? Okay. All right, so we're gonna go on to lower body exercises. So what we have here is just a simple sit to stand. Um, and if you recognize the body positioning, it's very similar to doing a squat. Um, and so essentially you're using a chair and you're squatting down in front of it. Um, you're gonna start by standing directly in front of a chair. You inhale and you exhale as you slowly lower yourself down um, to you're just above the seat. Um, you can place your hands on your knees for support. You can actually sit down if you wanna sit down. Um, and so, um, or you can just kind of hover above it. So it's, it's totally up to you. It's definitely more challenging to go all, almost all the way down and then stand back up. Um, so feel free if you need to sit and then stand back up, you're still working similar muscle groups. Then I have um, some calf raises. Um, and essentially, we're going, you're going to stand behind a chair. You can also stand behind your kitchen countertop. Hold on to the chair or the countertop. Um, you're going to raise up on your toes with both feet, keeping your back straight. Um, you can hold that position if you want, or you can come right back down. Um, you're going to repeat this exercise 10, 10 times um, and then increase your repetitions as you feel stronger. This next exercise um, is your hip abductor exercises. This is great for, um, you know, building hip strength. Um, and so you're going to start off slowly. Um, and let's see, start slowly so that you can have, you don't have, so that if you have joint damage, you don't further cause damage. I know I actually, um, just to, you know, somebody wants to come in the waiting room. Let me admit, <laughs> I'm not used to being the uh, moderator. Um, okay, so start off slowly. So if you have joint damage, you don't further cause damage. Um, you'll want to, um, what I was going to share with you guys is I, over COVID, I started having some hip pain and I noticed it because when I would sit on the floor, um, to play games and such, build Legos with my kids, I would sit Indian style and have hip pain. And I thought it was a pulled muscle for a long time, but it lasted. And so I'm now figuring out that I have limited range of motion in my hips. So one of the things uh, the doctor has reckoned for me is not to go beyond, um, you know, what is comfortable for me as far as movement until we really start getting some work done with PT. Um, you'll want to stand behind a chair, mm -hmm. holding on to the chair, um, raise your leg out to the side as high as comfortable, slowly lowering down. Remember to use his breathing techniques. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't, and not a stickler for whether you inhale or exhale at a certain point. My whole thing is do your best to keep the um, air moving. Repeat that exercise 10 times. Um, here's some partial or mini squats. You can kind of just get behind the chair or hold on to a countertop stand behind it and then slowly bend both knees, keeping your back straight and your heels on the floor. Um, 
you know, back positioning is really important with all these exercises. Um, and actually I can send them to Don and Cynthia. So you guys, if you need to go back and look at some of these slides, um, you can feel welcome to do so. That would be fine. So I would repeat this exercise 10 times again, increasing your repetitions as you feel stronger with each exercise. Here's some hip extension. Um, this will help the glutes as well. You're gonna hold on to the chair um, and then lift your leg behind you, um, keeping the knees straight, um, repeating this exercise with each leg 10 times. And then I'm just gonna go into some simple upper body exercises. Um, the wall push up is pretty, uh, kind of self-explanatory, but you just wanna stand in front of a wall um, I actually stood in front of a door, not for this picture, only because <laughs> I, when I was going around the house, most of my walls are not blank. And I felt like all the pictures were very distracting for my readers and my blog. <laughs> so I was like, well, here's a white wall and a white door. I'll just stand in front of that. But I do not recommend standing in front of your door, especially if you have people that come in and out. Um, but you're going to lift your arms up to shoulder level placing your palms on the wall, um, slightly wider than your shoulder width. Inhale, bend your elbows, leaning slightly into the wall, blow out through pursed lips, and as you push yourself back up. Do not arch your back, as this will put too much pressure on your spine. And I would start off small with your repetitions for this because you know your, your, your arms are having to do a lot of work with these exercises. But again, like with this, all of these exercises, it doesn't oh, require you to have any um, weights or anything like that. So um, this is specifically just to use the, use gravity and push against it essentially. So start low, five repetitions and work your way up. With the dumbbell bent over row, I am using weights for with this exercise, but you can use soup cans, ketchup bottles, uh, water bottles, um, to do any of these exercises at home. So don't let it stop you that you don't have some fancy weights in your house to do it. Um, use anything you see, but make sure the weight's even in both hands. Um, so if you find soup cans, they need to be the same size, same weight. Um, so this dumb, dumbbell bent over row, remembering to keep your uh, back straight you're going to kind of, you can, you can do this actually in a chair as well. I'm standing, but if you sit, you're just going to make sure um, that you're slightly bent over um, at your hips, keeping your head and neck aligned. Um, you're going to let the weight down in front of you and then kind of pull it up and kind of feel like you're almost um, pinching a, a pencil between your shoulder blades. You're just gonna really pull it up and squeeze. Um, start out with eight um, repetitions, eight to 10, um, and then um, increase as you go along. Rule of thumb, if you cannot do eight repetitions of an exercise that requires uh, hand weights, um, the weights are too heavy. Um, so just go down even further. Uh, don't beat yourself up about how much you're lifting. Be proud of yourself for doing the exercise um, and moving forward with your, you know, your wellness and your physical what size fitness. Would you say you should start with? What's that, Dot? What size weights would you say you should start with? Well, if you haven't been doing any arm exercises, I would say, let's see, in rehab, we would start two to three pounds for women and three to five pounds for men. Um. But I would, you know, if you don't have them, I would just pick up a soup can and <laughs> feel if it feels good in your hand um, or a ketchup bottle. Sometimes if, if the soup cans start to get heavy, you know, they start to get wide and then it's like not comfortable to hold in your hand. Um, and so I've, you, uh, you can use things like, yeah, like the ketchup bottles may be easier to hold, um, Worcestershire bottles, olive oil bottles, um, things like that. Um, to lift, but yeah, I would say, and you can, you can purchase hand weights from places like five and below and Walmart for relatively cheap. You can usually find three and five pound uh, weights at uh, five and below. Um, but as you increase the ones I have here in these pictures, this is the um, Bowflex Select, Select-A-Tech weight system. 
And it, it was expensive to get, but the reason why we purchased it was because um, my husband and I both used this workout room and those weights went from five to 45 pounds, I think. Um, and we could just basically have one set and just select each one. Um, I don't like that they're so big from top to bottom because when, as women, we do certain exercises, our, our shoulders just aren't, there's the distance between where my hand is and the end of the weight is, is long. Um, and so I feel like as a girl, a woman who uses not near as friendly to use. Um, but I do like the fact they take up very little space, but they are very, very pricey. So that's what he wanted. So we went with that. Um, and I think as for him, for men, they have more of a range of weight that they can use to exercise. Like he'll do something with 20 pounds. And the next, next thing I know, he's doing something with 35 pounds and, um, which is wonderful for him. Um, but if we were to have all those increments sitting in our workout room, it would just take up too much space. Neither one of us wanted that. So this is the hammer curl. Um, this is, I, I added this one instead of the standard bicep curl, because I feel like most people know the up and down with the, with the palms up but you can actually turn your palms face in and you work more, uh, you work the bicep too, but a lot of the front of the shoulder on um, this top deltoid piece here, um, and it really helps to shape the arm. Um, and so I love the hammer curl. You can include that with a standard bicep curl if you want. You can do the standing or sitting. Um, you just wanna keep the elbows close to the body, um, breathe with the movement, um, and, uh, and just kind of take it slow, essentially. Oh man, I don't know why I keep doing that. I think it's my computer. All right. All right, this is the bent over fly. Um, you want to hold the dumbbells in your hands, stand with your feet apart. Um, this also can be done sitting um, but just keep in mind that, um, that it, it, you need to have full range of motion when your arms come out to the side. Um, this will work the shoulders, increase your shoulder strength. Um, remember when you're doing this, you don't go past um, that plane where your shoulders are at. Um, you're gonna lift both arms out to the side. If that's too hard for you, you can do one side at a time to just break it down to one side at a time um, and breathe as you do so. Perform 10 to 12 repetitions. Christina, I may be the only one, but I'm not seeing your screen. Okay, let me see here. Mm, let me find you. Share, try it again. Thanks. Is that better? Yes. Hold on, now I gotta get through it. Hold on. Let me see if I can just go down to pick it where I left off. There we go. Let's see. Um, all right, well, I'm just gonna pick up with this last slide. It was my last one anyway. Um, so again, seek guidance from your physician on what types of exercise they deem safe to begin with. Again, start low and slow, low impact, lightweight, few repetitions, listen to your body. And if you aren't confident, consider pulmonary rehab. I know it's sometimes at this point after COVID, it's, it's a little slow getting in there sometimes because they are limited on, on how many people they can have in there at any given time. Um, but it is a great way um, of building your confidence and you don't have to stay forever. You can just stay a limited number of visits um, just to build your confidence. Um, the, there are some online pulmonary rehab programs. I know there is pulmonary wellness online. Uh, Noah Greenspan runs that program. Um, he's pretty um, uh, involved in the pulmonary fibrosis community, uh, but he does a great program. Um, there's also a lift 
pulmonary rehab, I believe. I haven't done a whole lot of research on there, but you know, when I was um, at home for COVID, I was just kind of looking up because I would get emails saying, what are, where can I do pulmonary rehab online? And so I think it's called Lift. I don't know if they do a weird spelling of the word Lift, <laughs> um, but it's Lift Pulmonary Rehab and Pulmonary Wellness Online. Um, I don't want to vouch for those programs that they're fantastic because I don't know enough about them. Um, but there are options to research if you're interested. Okay. Does anybody have any questions to me for me about exercise um, or anything in regards to pulmonary rehab? I can answer anything um, that if you have questions about for a respiratory therapist, I might be able to answer. Christina, I'd just like to say something about um, pulmonary wellness and Noah Greenspan. Yeah. I think it's a great program if you can get past um, all of him. Uh, it's very <laughs> focused on him and his tattoos and, and yeah. all, uh, but, but he does a great program. It's just um, too much of him. I found it uh, distracting for me. I wanted something kind of linear and, and he just kind of wanders around. He's very creative and very, uh, uh, he likes to have good scenery and psychedelic stuff and all, but it, it is, <laughs> It is a good program. He's very popular online and pe some people sing his praises and um, feel like, you know, he's done, you know, a very good job for them. Um, yeah. But you're right. He's got a very- patients. He's worked a lot with COVID patients and apparently had a lot of success with that. Yes. Um, and yes, it, he does have, a, uh, I think he does have a book and like, you know, he, he does a great job with advertising. Yes. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, you know, I do get questions sent to me, like, do you think his program is good? And, you know, one of the questions I have for any online pulmonary rehab is how can they adequately assess the patient with whether it's safe enough to exercise if they don't get to see them and work with them and see it for their eyes? Like, how are they really doing with this exercise? And so I, I find it difficult to give anybody an exercise prescription without working with them. You know, all of these exercises on this program are, you know, are the ones that I had in my presentation are great exercises, but they, they're not going to work for everybody. And so you kind of have to use it as a suggestion. And if you've got shoulder issues, some of these exercises aren't going to work for you. That's why I think the dialogue with the, the physician is really important because they may be able to point out some things, some other things that you have with your health that you may need to keep an eye out on. And the other thing is if you can get in, if you're not sure about exercise and you haven't been active, it is great to get into rehab and just get, get, you know, Chris will even tell you, she just, sometimes she does like two to three visits just for education alone um, and then she releases the patient and she says, I'm very confident they can do it on their own. Um, and so I, I do worry about that with the online programs and they're just not able to adequately assess the patient, um, before they get them started. Um, so that that's worrisome, but he, he seems to be making a living doing what he's doing, but you're right, Dot. He is very eccentric in the way he looks and dresses and the glasses and, everything that he does, but a lot of people have respect for what he does and, um, and he's been effective for some. So it's there for you to research if you're like dying to start an online pulmonary wellness or rehab program. <laughs> Maybe it's a generational thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I as a healthcare provider, I want to be there with the patient. Um, and you know, the, I think it was Medicare, um, that has not approved it yet for insurance reimbursement and I, unless that's changed but as of last summer when rehabs were trying to open and they were like how can we see these patients can we start billing for seeing them online medicare said no we're not going to pay for that um so i don't know if that has changed but as of last summer they said they weren't going to do it so that's why you don't see why henrico doctors or chippenham hasn't started seeing patients online yet it's because you know, there's no real way to charge a patient for seeing them through a computer. Hey guys, it's yeah. Herb and I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, I finally Shandy. made it. 
<laughs> I, I, Jackie, I just got out of rehab, so I finally made it. Oh, good. Good. glad to have you. Hi, Herb. Good seeing you. <laughs> good to see y'all. You look great. Christine? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Is it possible to get that um, your slideshow sent to us so that we can work through it? Absolutely. I'll send it to Don and Cynthia, and they can send it out to the whole group if you want. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so I, I just wanted to make a comment about um, Christina discussed uh, uh, pulse oximeters, and um, I know a lot of the C a lot of the um, C you know the CVSs and Walgreens are out of them, but now the um, several watch manufacturers actually sell watches with the pulse oximeter on it, and I actually have the Garmin five five X plus, and it ha it measures my pulse ox every minute. So like when nice. I'm on, when I'm on a walk or when I'm sleeping or whenever I need to get a glimpse of my pulse ox, it does it every minute, or I can go directly to the screen and have it do an on-demand pulse ox reading. And as you may, many of you are probably aware, and Christina may, may add some light on this, but I believe a pulse ox of between 90 and 100 is healthy, correct? Yes. So that's what we... That's what we consider acceptable in rehab is to stay above 90% and above. If you dip it occasionally, it's, a, it's okay. I wouldn't worry too much, but you want to have the goal of staying 90% and above. And to dovetail off that, Christina, because I have a question about it. Does your um, whole socks actually decline? Mine seems to decline when I'm sleeping. Hmm. And then it, when I wake up, it goes back up to... A higher level and i'm not sure it's because i'm if i'm snoring or maybe oh. face down or what yep. but, uh, well i think spring. we do take smaller breaths when we're breathing um and so maybe those small tidal breaths are not um oxygenating you as adequately as your normal breathing should do um and so as long as again as your numbers are staying well above 90% throughout your sleep. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, it could be some some obstruction, you never know. Uh, snoring could definitely cause it. Some obstruction can cause lower oxygen, lower oxygen saturations than, than when you are awake. Um, but as long as it stays in the 90s, I wouldn't worry too much about it because I'm not sure that as, a, as in healthcare that they would even treat it unless it starts falling into the 80s. Well, I go, I go into the high 80s at, when I sleep briefly, like when I'm in, when I hit REM sleep, I'm, mm. I'm 88, but Do my average is 93. Does so Does that watch have an alarm if your oxygen level goes below a certain point? I haven't read the manual yet, but um, I think it probably does. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I Sleep think bed. the Garmin was doing that and Apple's come out with a pulse ox on their watch too. Um, so yeah, it, the, it, the standard pulse oxes what run about, what are they doing? Are like 20, 30, $35 uh, that you, you can you, find them? You can get them fairly inexpensive on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Because my one that was I a had, time though. Yeah, my one that I had for, two, for 10 years finally stopped working and I got a new one and I think it was 20 something dollars on Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, it okay. and it works just fine. Is it portable? Yeah, that's another question yeah, I get. Yeah, just one of the is, little do, ones. Oh, good. yeah. Yeah. And a lot of questions I get is, do um, the little ones from CVS work as well as the ones in the hospital? Um, and so the way that they can, it's basically all the same technology. It's just how fast that technology calculates the um, the algorithm that's within the mini computer essentially. Um, and so some of the hospital ones may be slightly faster, um, but for home use, it's perfect. At, when we've compared almost every single pulse ox that a patient has brought in that they've purchased mm -hmm. on their own versus the one we would use in rehab, I mean, they were maybe off by 1%, it was negligible. Um, and so sometimes it may be a little bit slower um, and they work, obviously work their best with the fully charged battery. Um, but for the most part, it, it, it's wonderful technology that you can have in, in your home. 
Um, and so I encourage you to have one to use, um, whether it be your watch. I, I love the idea of the watch. I may need to have my husband upgrade mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, me too. Me um, too. But I love the because uh, I love my Apple Watch. Um, but um, but the the standard pulse ox, if you can find one either on Amazon or locally, works great. Yeah, they're pretty cheap. Yeah, like twenty bucks. Any other questions for me? I can answer about anything uh, exercise or non-exercise related. <laughs> um, okay, guys. I just well, want right. to tell you. Thank you I just very much. Oh, go ahead. I just want to tell you, I live a mile from Lee Davis High School. Oh, good, Dottie. My parents are out in Old Church. Okay. Um, I used to live in Brandy Creek. I don't know if you know where that is, just sure. down Lee Davis Road. Um, that's where I grew up. And then they built their home in Old Church. And so they're still, actually, my parents and my sister mm -hmm. um, and her family are all out in Eastern Hanover in Old Church. So, um, yep, you're, I go, I'm sure I ride right past your house all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Christina, Barbara Ralston, who's in the hospital with COVID, said to give you a shout out. No. She you're presenting today. I, I love her. <laughs> so yeah. the thing I shared with Dawn and Cynthia the other day is Barbara is such a great person to have as a part of this group because she has such amazing positivity. It like it just exudes from every little part of her body. It doesn't matter. She's had the worst day, the worst feeling day, the worst health day. She will put a smile on and be just the most delightful person um, in the room. It, it, it really like, it, it, she puts things into perspective for me a lot of times. I remember coming to rehab and it would just be like the kids were not good that morning and oh, I got in 30 minutes late because of traffic or whatever it was. And if I saw Barbara and she always had a smile on her face and was just so yes. grateful and happy for every day that she has. So I'm going to definitely keep her in my prayers because like, I mean, like this, she wanted me to, to, she wanted to say hi during my presentation. That's how sweet she is all the time, even though she feels like terrible in the hospital. So, um, I love that lady. And, um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, you know, as a board member, as a respiratory therapist, as your presenter, you are, feel free to email me, uh, drop me a line. If, if you just want to run something past me and um, I'm around, um, I think the COPD Foundation wants me to be around too. And so I'm here, I'm tangible. So just, you know, you could either go to my um, blog and email me through there, or I'm sure uh, my contact information is available uh, through our, my board participation. So reach out to me if you, if you have anything you want me to answer. All right, guys. Well, it was Christina, a pleasure. Thank, thank you so very much for giving us a, a, Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation on what we're supposed to be doing. And, and I, I, I wanted to stand up and start doing it because I, I felt like a slog while you were talking. So I'm expecting all of you to do some dance partying in your room, in your family rooms this evening. But turn up the music loud, your favorite tunes. And start videotape it and send it to you, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs>